Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 34 now of Montague Island Books. Now, our author guest today has lived in Newcastle for 25 years and considered himself, considers himself an adopted Geordie, though he still can't speak the language, he's, so he says. He's a successful playwright who has also worked as a journalist and spin doctor for the City Council. And prior to that, he served in the Royal Navy for 16 years, joining as a writer. Now, he also holds an MA in creative writing and crime fiction from the UEA. And his first novel, The Man on the Street, won the CWA John Creasy Dagger, which is the, the New Blood Dagger. Also won the Crime Fest Specsavers Best Crime Debut Award. And he was shortlisted for the Feakston's All Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year. His second book, One Way Street, is out in uh, hardback, ebook, and audiobook. And I'm sure we will be finding out more. So, a very good morning to Trevor Wood. How are we, Trevor? You okay? I'm very well, Joe. That sounded very impressive. I was quite impressed by that. That was from your Amazon account, <laughs> from your Amazon bio. So. I was like, I'd forgotten at least one of those. <laughs> it's always a danger, isn't it? Because Amazon make it look like it's. Um, it's updated and but sometimes you go on and they're like a few years out of date so just got to check them out for <laughs> you have to prod mostly it's um the publishers who who get to update yeah. that i don't have any control uh, over it at all but now and again you look at it and you go can you just change this because it's ancient you know <laughs> so i've actually been in your castle for at least 30 years now all ah, you know. right so that needs uh, that needs a bit of an update but at yeah. least we got i think most of it right yeah yeah and, no it was fine it was fine. yeah but it's great to have you. We've uh, been meaning to get you on for quite some time, and then different things are happening. But we finally, uh, we finally got you, and a great way to start off a Monday morning. So, for those people, uh, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about more of them. You know, mine was just a very brief intro. So, tell us a bit, Trevor, about yourself and about your books for both people who may be not both few, very few people who maybe not heard of you before. <laughs> I'm so bloody old, Joe. This could take a long time. So, I'll give you the very abbreviated version. Um, I mean, like Joe said, I was in the Navy for 16 years after I left school. Bizarrely, as a writer, it's one of the oldest branches in the Royal Navy. It's kind of admin slash HR slash yeah. finance. Um, uh, and and when, when I met and married my Geordie wife, she took one look at Portsmouth and said, I'm not living here. So, <laughs> so I basically left the Navy and moved to Newcastle, which I'd never been to in my life before, but instantly took to. Um, Brilliant. And I kind of went back to the thing that I kind of thought about doing when I'd left school, but I wasn't qualified, um, uh, journalism. So I did a journalism course, uh, eventually worked on the local papers up here. But while I was on the course, I met a guy called Ed Woff, who um, for some reason, about four or five years later, we'd been mates and going for beer and stuff, said, um, why don't we try and write something? And I still have no idea why he thought that would be a good <laughs> idea. Um, but we, we sat down, we both gave up our jobs. I mean, it was ridiculous, wow. really. We both gave up our jobs and sat down to try and write a play, um, having never hardly been to the theatre. <laughs> it was just a, you know, one of those moments, midlife crisis madness, I think. Um, but because of our contacts, it, we managed to get somebody to read it in one of the theatres. And because we worked for the press, when he agreed to put it on, we got a lot of publicity. The play did really well, and it all sprang from there, really. Right. So we ended up writing about a dozen plays, all of which were professionally produced, some of which are still on to this day, uh, touring around the world. Um, and about six years ago, it, it, the work didn't start to dry up, but it just became harder and harder to get plays on. Uh, most theatres are run by councils. They had no money. You know, councils were having, they had more important things to spend money on than <laughs> developing <laughs> theatre, really. Um, so we had to do it all ourselves. We had to raise money ourselves. We had to, you know, put our own money in at times. Oh, we had to yeah. we had to produce the plays. We had to audition the actors. We had to book the venues and and design the posters. And <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't really what I wanted to do. You know, I just wanted to write. So so we agreed. Ed was quite happy doing that. So so we decided to do a Lennon and McCartney thing where I had a bit of a solo moment. So he carried on doing <laughs> doing some plays that he wanted to do. Uh, and I decided to try and write a crime novel. Um, 
Uh, and eventually out of that, I went on to the MA that you were talking about at the University of East Anglia, which was the first one they'd ever done. They'd always been the biggest literary writing university, really. You know, people like Ian McEwen and Ishiguru have done the MA there. But then that, just at the right time for me, they suddenly decided they would do a specialist crime writing one. And I thought, well, I've got to apply for that. And I got a place on it. And it was a fantastic course. I mean, um, I think there were 11 of us that, that finished the course and five of us are now published crime writers. Two others have got agents. Uh, and that includes Harriet Tice, whose Blood Orange was developed on the course. Um, Kate Simans, uh, who wrote Lock Me In and A Ruined Girl. So it was a brilliant course and we all pushed each other to the limits. Um, and that's where the man on the street was developed. Great. And the rest is history. I say <laughs> so what what drew you into crime fiction over, over any other genre? It's what I'd, I've always read primarily. I mean, I, it, it's since I was a kid, I, I, I always blame Enid Blyton. I think she's yeah. the gateway drug to crime fiction for, Definitely, yeah. for, for people <laughs> of my age anyway. Um, so I from there, and I remember being on a, a barge holiday with my cousin and his family in, on the Norfolk Broads when I was probably about 13, I guess. And it just rained the whole time and it was miserable. And of course, we were too young to go to the pub, which is the whole joy <laughs> yeah. of barge holidays. Um, but they had a little bookshelf on the, uh, on the barge, which was full of Agatha Christie books. And I read shed loads of those. And ever since then, really, nine tenths of what I read is crime. So it was the obvious genre for me to try I think yeah. and do you still get chance to read a lot of uh, crime from the crime genre or does it a case of you're always busy writing so you don't get much chance to oh read? god no I read I, I, I read tons I've all I've never not got a book on the go I, I literally finish one book pick another one up and start again it's it's and again it's still mostly crime I mean I have I, I think since lockdown I kind of have tried to vary it a little bit um because sometimes you need just something to brighten up your day. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've read a few different things. And also I became part of this big debut group because there were a lot of us who debuted during lockdown. I mean, my book was out about two days before they closed all the books. Oh. Um, we formed quite a tight knit group on social media called Debut 20, really. Oh. Um, and that's, that's not just crime writers, it's historical fiction, romance, you name it. Um, uh, and we've become really close friends. So I've, I've read, obviously, a lot of their books. And there's quite a few historical um, fiction writers in there. So I've read quite a few things like um, Fran Quinn, The Smallest Man is terrific. Uh, Black Drop, Leonora Natras is kind of crimey, but historical. Um, so I've read a lot of different things in the last 18 months. But still, I mean, I've got a box full over on the sofa there of proofs and stuff that people sent me, and and books that I want to read that I just yeah. haven't had time to get round to. I've got I've got dozens of them. Yeah. So it's, an, it's, an, it's like it's like painting the fourth road bridge, isn't it? You just never stop. <laughs> yeah. You keep getting you keep taking more in, but it's like, yeah. well, when do I get to them? <laughs> yeah. There's some golden stuff in that box over there, and I just haven't got time at the moment, but I will get there eventually. Definitely. But then somebody else gives you another proof and you think, oh, that looks great. I'll read that one. <laughs> yeah, you've got to have a, an, an order, haven't you? Or else it just goes <laughs> over. <in> the... <laughs> but that's, uh, that's great. So what we'll do now is we'll start to get you ready to go off to Montague Island. Now, for, those, for anyone who's sort of not seen any of the videos before, Montague Island is a fictional island that was created by Mike Craven. Um, in the curator and uh, as I live in Cumbria and that was set off the Cumbria coast that was sort of it all, it all fell together and that's where the name comes from but basically it's like Desert Island Disc but for books is the way I always put it so you're allowed to take seven books with you of your choice books that sort of um, that you know you, you've, you've, you've read and would like to read again and would be nice company on the top of the island you're also allowed a CD a DVD, a food item, and a luxury item. So first of all, we'll start on the books. Um, so what would be the first book that you would take along with you to, uh, you know, to, to the <laughs> island? I'm going to, let's go back to the beginning. I'm going to take The Island of Adventure by Enid Blyton. Great. Uh, which seems to be the perfect book to take to an island. It's it does. An island. Yeah. Um, and they're the, 
I mean, obviously, I haven't read it since I was about 12, probably, so it's probably awful. But, you know, the nostalgia factor will be high. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it might give me, some, give me some tips about how to survive on an island. <laughs> and also, it's the series. I mean, everybody talks about the Famous Five and the Secret Seven and that, but, but that adventure series, as I think we'll call them, the Island of Adventure, and I can't remember what the others were. No, I can't, no. But they were all something of adventure. Yeah. Uh, and they were exactly, the, it was exactly the same format it was a group of kids you know investigating something so i'd like to go back to that i haven't read it for you know, no. 50 years but as you say worth it for no nostalgia alone yeah uh, and i know you know enid now has a bit of a checkered past i believe uh, yeah i believe so but you know different times yeah and the books are, the books are still uh it's not going to affect the books is it no, so exactly. you know um you could enjoy the books for what they are and I think if we knew, you know, a lot of the sort of, particularly when you get into horror and things like that, you know, if we knew a lot about the writers, we would be shocked. So, <laughs> you know, you just got to enjoy the book for what it yeah. is, do not we? But yeah, I like that one and a great start with Enid Blyne. So what's the second book you'd take with you, Trevor? Well, I'm immediately going to go much darker, which is the kind of thing I normally read. I think, And I read this when I was a teenager first, and it's probably the book that, that made me think, oh, I can read grown-up books now. I don't have to carry on reading other stuff, which is um, A Clockwork Orange. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, if people have only seen the film, I, I don't actually like the film very much. I think it's pretty gratuitous and, and, and doesn't really tell the story of the book, whereas the book is all about what it means to be human, I think. And, um, and I have reread that several times, and it's a fabulous book. Um, so I, I, And also, it's got... Um, um, for those who haven't read it, it's got a kind of made up language in the book, a kind of almost Russian thing called NADSAT. So the back of the book has a huge glossary of all the terms. And when you first read it, you're constantly flicking backwards and forwards to learn this new language. So again, on an island, it's ideal. You can spend <laughs> yeah. hours learning a new language and reading a great book. Speak to yourself in the language or you can have a conversation <laughs> with yourself. <laughs> and it's a film that should be remade, actually. I know it's probably... Um... <laughs> Film buffs will hate me for it, but I, I don't think the original director um, did as good a job as he should have. Yeah, good point. But um, it's like a modern classic, really, isn't it? That one. The I book is. The book's amazing. Book. Yeah. It introduces a lot of people, I think, doesn't it? Just at that time where they're going into adult, and it's like probably, as you say, you know, first sort of adult book that they've read. But again, well, it was incredibly thing. cool as well, Joe. It was an incredibly cool book. Oh, that, so, yeah, but it was, yeah. I just used to walk around with it in my hands. Just carry it, carry it yeah. on the bus, you know. <laughs> Didn't read it, just carry it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's book number three going to be? Whoa. You, you're saying this like I've got a list. Well, you Which should have. <laughs> making this up as I go along. I'm going to go... I'm, I'm going to go... Um, I haven't read a lot of Dickens, you know, which is Ooh, yeah. crazy, really. Um, uh, but I've loved a lot of the films that are based on Dickens, mm. and I think my favourite's probably Great Expectations, and I'm imagining it's a very, very long book, which, again, would be very useful on an island. Yeah. Uh, and I, it will be an education for me. And I like the fact, I mean, what I do know about him is that it, it's all about character as much as story, and I prefer books that are based around character rather than plot and uh, yeah. And I think Dickens would really tick all the boxes. And it's about time, frankly, that I started reading some. Same for me, really. Uh, I do need to uh, need to get really get into them. And uh, but you don't have plenty of time on the island, so that's great. <laughs> so ju just as a break in between the books, um, we also uh, I also know you do a few other things as well. So you're on like Northern Crime Syndicate. So maybe you can explain what that is for those people that don't know that don't know about it. Yeah, well. Uh, kind of probably about six months before before the pandemic appeared um uh, i my my book was released in e and just in ebook form early it was like a soft launch as they call it just to kind of try and get some word of mouth going before the actual launch yeah um so i was at the harrogate crime festival um that year which would have been 2019 i guess yeah. um uh, and I'd already met a few of the other Northern writers because uh, I'd done Noir at the Bar, mm. which is a, a reading, a live reading thing that they do in Newcastle run by Vic Watson. Um, 
who now does Baytels with Simon Buick. Yeah, so, right. so I'd done a few of those things. So I knew a few of the guys and I was at Harrogate um, actually handing out proofs in the marquee there. Um, and of course, uh, it's also a bar there. So you just hang about chatting with people. <laughs> and um, a couple of the guys, Rob Scragg, uh, Judith O'Reilly, um, who are both Northeast based, uh, had started to talk about setting up a little group of Northern based writers to kind of work together and, and do events together and help promote each other's work. Um, and they, they approached me and I was like, yeah, straight away. I've always, I'm a big sports. I've always played sport all my life. So I'm a big team. I like teams. <laughs> so the idea of being on a team of crime writers was compelling immediately. So I said yeah. yes immediately straight away. And, um, and of course we spent the next three or four months kind of working out what we were going to do. And we'd set up a whole series of events in bookshops, um, and about a week before we were going to do our first one, everything closed. And, <laughs> and we've still never really been able to do a live event properly. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, the very first one uh, we managed to do was about three weeks ago. And I was in Canada and couldn't <laughs> do it. Like, oh, I thought, my daughter lives in Canada and we, we've been spending the whole year trying to get out there, but the rules prevented it. And we suddenly had an opportunity, so I had to go. Um, so I've missed the only actual live event we've done, but um, but because of uh, because of that, we almost we we embraced Zoom really early. So almost right from the start, we start to do Zoom events, initially little panels. But then Rob Parker, who's <laughs> another one of our gang, um, he teaches in schools quite a bit, and he had this thing that he did with school kids where he got them to make up a story from scratch just to learn a little bit about how you can develop plots and stuff. So he decided it would be a good idea for us to do that as a Zoom. So we do they are great sessions. I love yeah, them. Good fun. <laughs> so we do a series called Whose Crime Is It Anyway, based on that kind of improv comedy show that used to be on the telly, yeah. where we literally we have a, an audience in the chat room throwing out ideas and we literally make a book up in an hour from scratch. And they're insane. Um, but great fun. <laughs> and the audience really gets involved and throws. So we'll we'll go right, uh, you know what's the name of the main character what's his job and the audience are throwing stuff in the chat room and we just we just riff off of that really so it's great fun and it is hilarious and he even does robbie i think it's robbie who does it he even does a book cover at the yeah. end as well, he? He does. <laughs> Which the book covers are fun. probably the highlight i think yeah should have a calendar of those book covers i think <laughs> <laughs> but that's great now you're talking there about um you know, sort of working part of a, a team, and and over another thing, very important thing that you're involved in is uh, a volunteer kitchen. So, yeah. do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that? Yeah, well, I was when I started the the MA. Uh, unlike everybody else, I didn't turn up with a plan. I mean, the, the joy of the MA and the reason I really wanted to do it is because it wasn't. The whole point was to write a crime novel, right? the deliverable at the end of two years. Part It was part time. So you only had to rock up every um, three weekends a year. The rest of the time was online. It was peer to peer feedback. You would post 10,000 words of your book and everybody would pile in and tell you what was wrong with it. Um, very constructively. Don't get me wrong. It was yeah. incredibly useful. Um, but everybody else turned up with an idea of what their book was going to be. And I really didn't. Um, and that first weekend, um, I mean, it was enormous fun. Our first visiting writer was Lee Child. We had three hours chatting to Lee Child in the classroom, which, you know, is, is not a bad start to a course. Great. So I went home kind of inspired, but with no idea what I was going to start writing. Um, and my wife and I were just throwing ideas around. I wanted to write something that was set in the real world that was quite political. Because um, I, I, one of the great things about crime fiction for me is that you can set it in any world. You can deal with any subject you like. Um, and sometimes the crime's almost incidental. It's about creating a world. Uh, and I wanted to do something that was real. I wanted to set it in Newcastle because it is my, uh, I've lived all over the place because I was in the Navy for 16 years. I've lived all over the place. And uh, as soon as I got to Newcastle, it felt like home. Yeah. Um, and I've embraced it and vice versa, I think. And I wanted to write it as a kind of love letter to the city as well. So I wanted to do something real. And, and out of the 20 ideas, I think I think it was Pam who said, what if a homeless man saw a murder? And I thought, that's such a great idea. And immediately I could see how that would work as a crime story. But I didn't know enough about the homeless world, if you like. Um, but when I was researching, the first thing I found was about 
the estimates change, but roughly at the time then they thought about 10% of the homeless were ex-servicemen. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, that's a good start because yeah. 16 years in the Navy, I know what it's like to be an ex-serviceman. I know a lot of ex-servicemen. I can, I can write that character, but I don't know anything about what it's like to be homeless. So I, I went down to the People's Kitchen in Newcastle, which is a fantastic charity. It's entirely volunteer run, so nobody gets paid from top to bottom. Uh, and they feed the homeless of Newcastle every single day of the week. Um, at the time, it was about 100 people a day. At the moment, it's about 230 a day. So the That's numbers are going up a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I went down and, you know, just to get some info and chat to people and have a look around, really. Uh, and I tried to volunteer, but, but you know, one of the great things about this city is there was a waiting list to, to <laughs> volunteer there, which is incredible because, you know, you work quite long hours, nobody gets paid. but uh but after about six months i managed to get a slot so i've been working every tuesday afternoon for about the last three and a half years um uh, in the kitchen there cooking yeah. for at the time 100 people but now it's about 230 um oh, well, there's only yeah. really yeah. there's only really three of us who cook we produce a, mm -hmm. a three course meal soup a main course and a pudding and a vegetarian option for about 230 people and it yeah. gets me off my fat ass to do some actual proper work. So um, do, you, do you have to sort of decide on the menu and things like that, or is it just yeah. what's available? So you uh, it's a it, it's a bit of both. It used to be a bit more freewheeling. It used to be a bit like you know a Master Chef episode where they just give you twenty <laughs> ingredients and off you go. Yeah. And there's still a little bit of that. So like for the soup, we'll just see what's been donated, what's in the fridges, and just conjure something up. The other stuff we tend to plan ahead. So we'll plan the meals for the next two or three weeks uh, um yeah. so yeah but uh, the food's great i have to yeah. say brilliant that's, of course that's i would say that though because i'm one of the cooks you know? <laughs> of course but if you're getting that many people in every day it's obviously and uh, you know they're, they're, they're grateful for it because of the the homeless but they're obviously enjoying it as well if you keep yeah coming back. well it's been a weird because obviously the pandemic changed it a lot so it's yeah. it's always had um you know its own dining hall and stuff like that but for obvious reasons that was closed yeah. um so we became instantly we became a takeaway service so they developed mm -hmm. a system for providing it as takeaway and it's only last week is the first time they've let the friends as they call them back mm -hmm. into the building um so we actually have got a kind of hybrid thing now where it's some takeaway and some yeah. people sitting in great um, but yeah it's a great place to work and good to hear that it's and you can donate i think peopleskitchen.co.uk i think it is but you can donate you can volunteer your time if you live in the northeast um even donate clothes whatever because they do clothes and they do um uh things like washing materials so toothpaste so all that they provide sleeping bags you name it brilliant so hopefully somebody will be listening who as a cosmetics company or whatever and can just yeah, do it great. And stuff. So that would be great, wouldn't it? Right. So that's that's wonderful work and great. It's great to hear all about that. So what we'll do now is we'll continue with the books. I think we're now on to book four and that'll give you a bit of time to have a think of some more. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the next book going to be? Oh, it, it's my memory now, isn't it? It's <laughs> struggling. I'll go when I when I um was doing the MA, uh Although the whole point was to write your novel, there were there were a couple of academic things. They have to put something in there. So there were a couple of things you had to do. And, and one of them was to write um, like a 5,000 word essay based around a writer of your choice. Um, and I've always been fascinated by James Elroy, um, who, I mean, it's we just go and watch some videos of him doing book readings and stuff. The man's off the scale of lunacy, uh, really. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd always been interested in his writing. It's kind of challenging. It's not easy read by any means. Uh, but he also has a really fascinating backstory. His, his mum was murdered um, uh, and the, the um, murderers were never, it was never solved. It became, it's quite a famous case called The Black Dahlia. Um, and his first book was kind of loosely based around that. Right. Um, uh, and so I wrote a whole thing about the L.A. Quartet, which includes um, L.A. Confidential, which is a brilliant crime film if you've never seen it. So uh, I think any one of the L.A. Quartet, really, but L.A. Confidential is probably the most accessible um, 
So let's go with that. I yeah. think, it's, and it's a again a sprawling book, full of story and character. So uh, I, I'm, I'm filling my time up on yeah, this island. That's what you need. Just uh, lot, lots of stuff to read, and uh, I love the story behind that as well. But you know how you sort of discovered it and looked into it, so that's great. So what uh, have you got? A, a number five book. <laughs> Tell you, I'll tell you a thing that I will try then. You what, did warn me, you did say you should prepare for this. I'm like, oh, I'll just busk so it. How, be how about we say, because you were just saying earlier how you sort of read a lot of books and it's putting you on the spot a little bit, this, but what's, what would you say the favourite book is that you've read this year? This year? Okay. Let's go, I think, fairly recent. Um, Let's go for Joe Knox's um, true crime story. I think um, I've always liked uh, Joe's previous books. He wrote a series with a very dodgy cop called Aidan Watts, who's kind of a drug addict, who breaks all the rules, um, just completely off. <laughs> he's kind of off the plan, really. His boss lets him do what he likes, and he's, he's, he's gone completely rogue. And I really enjoyed that series. Joe's a very good writer. Um, and I was a bit concerned when I heard he was abandoning that. Um, I don't know why I should be, because he was he was leaving it as a trilogy, and that's exactly what I'm doing with my book. So I should have gone, yeah, that's a great move, Joe, excellent. Uh, and thankfully, his, his standalone book, True Crime Story, is fantastic. Um, uh, if you've read Daisy Jones and the Six, which is one of my escapist books during lockdown, which is... Um, uh, a kind of fictional tale of Fleetwood Mac, the band, really. Right. It, but it's told from like umpteen different perspectives, like all these fictional band members give their views on what was going on at the wow. time, and it just flits between them. Well, True Crime Story is that almost exact same model. There's a disappearing, there's a girl who's disappeared, and um, we get the story from umpteen views her, her family her flatmates her sister all kinds of people and gradually the whole thing starts to fall into place uh, and it's a terrific read so I uh, probably I, I, it's a close thing and ironically the other book that I really like this year is called True Story so True Crime Story and True Story uh, yeah. True Story is by Kate Reed Petty um, which is it is pretty dark it's a story of a possible sexual assault slash rape but the girl has no memory of it and again it's kind of pieced together from different angles and you don't quite know who's telling the truth um uh and i thought that was a brilliant read as well so easy to remember true story and true yeah, crime so story we've either. got another one to uh, <clears throat> to add to the suitcase uh, so maybe for something a little bit different then um, you no doubt hear about a lot of books and whatever they're coming. So is there anything in the pipeline that's due to be coming out by an author that you sort of enjoy, that you're sort of looking forward to getting your hands on? Oh, one I haven't read. Well, that's an interesting shout. Yeah, um, just a bit different. I just That's a bit annoying. If you'd asked me about a week ago, I had... Because I was in Canada, I took a load of books with me as well for the flight yeah, and stuff. And I had like three or four proofs and I've read them all now. So I can't really <laughs> pick any one of those because I have read them. Um, but oh, let's go. Like... Let's let's go for my mate's book. That, you know, why not plug your friends? Um, yeah, so as I was saying, I did I did the MA with Harriet Tice, who developed Blood Orange um, on the course. And, you know, it 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 was already sold before we'd even finished the course. Wow. You got a, a great offer, you know, and it's been a massive Sunday Times bestseller. I mean, it's pretty hard act to follow for everybody else on the <laughs> bloody course. Man. Yeah, um, people. <laughs> but Harriet's a great friend of mine. We still share our work and you know critique each other's and give give each other a hand when when the need arises. Um, and her new book, which is called It Ends at Midnight, uh, is out in. April and I've just um, sent her editor my address to send me the proof so <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to uh, reading that. I have seen some early versions of it um, because like I say we do share our work still uh, but we you you know you never know quite how it's going to end up so uh, yeah that that's, it ends at midnight by Harry. And that's out in when April did you say? Uh, I believe it's April. April. So, yeah. That's great yeah. so we can keep an eye at that. 
<clears throat> so we've got your seven books all packed ready to go on the island for your for your stay, and it looks like you're going to have a, a great time reading all them and uh, and catching up on them. So as well um, on on the island, we believe there is about an hour and an hour a day of electricity. <laughs> so uh, that's all you get. It's, it's off coming, so you can imagine what the weather's going to be like. Um, so you're allowed also to take a CD with you. Now that can be a music CD, it can be um, you know um, a, an audio book on CD, what, whatever it may be. So what CD would you take with you? If you're only allowed to take one. <laughs> that would. Uh... <laughs> That would it, that would kill me to try and find one. I mean, I'm a huge music fan. I, I you know, until until all this crap happened, I'd go to Glastonbury every single year for about the last seven or eight years. I go and see bands continuously. I finally, in the last month, I've been able to get out and see bands again, <clears throat> which has been a joy because um, I've really yeah. missed that. So I've got a massive music collection, and asking me to choose one CD is just. So would it would it be um, like a, a mixed <laughs> list of, of songs rather than a? Again, I've got like loads a... of playlists that I pull together from stuff. Um, but I, I uh, let's plug a, a relatively unknown band. Um, the trouble is, I'm old and I can't remember the names of <laughs> album titles I anymore. I know the feeling. <laughs> but, there's a band called She Drew the Gun, a Liverpudlian band called She Drew the Gun, um, who I first saw at the at the last Glastonbury that happened, which again I guess 2019, mm -hmm. I guess, um, uh, and they were fantastic. I saw them um, in the on the John Peel stage, and then the next day Louisa Roach, who's the kind of main player in the band, the songwriter, lead singer, uh, played an acoustic set that I went to go and see as well, and that was. Brilliant. I've seen them again since then. Uh, and they're really deeply political. She's a huge left wing socialist. So the politics aligns with my own, um, uh, but she's also a great musician. Uh, and they've got, they've just released a third album. Um, and I can't remember the names of any of them. I, if I, you give me a moment, well, it'll come back well, to me. That, However, that, I will the plug. Name of the band is great. She yeah, really there's a great song in particular called Poem. Poem. which is particularly resonant for me because it's all about the homeless right. um and, and to my great joy when they they i was trying to get tickets for their recent gig up here um whilst i was away uh, and there was a problem with the booking system and by pure chance i just went onto their twitter feed and kind of said there seems to be a problem uh, and typically of the band i think louisa runs her own twitter feed uh, so the message i got back was from louisa so I thought there's a big Geordie saying, shy bands get out. <laughs> yeah. So while I had her attention, I asked her if she would let me quote some lines from Poem um, at the start of the third Jimmy Mullen book, um, which I have actually a little proof here. Ooh. This is Ooh. Hot Off The Presses. Nice. Um, it's the only copy I've got actually, but to my wow. great joy, right at the front is... Um, a quote from Louisa Roach, she drew the gun. Read it out to oh, us, um Because that's what we need to make the place neat. Take the homeless man's rags, no sleeping bags, no place to sleep. Because we're far too civilised around here to see an unkempt human being, a broken human being. Uh, it's a fantastic Long song. Words. Yeah, and I, I got to quote checking, it. I'll be going on Spotify after this and checking them. Checking it's, them out. Honestly, I'm, Joe, you I play it probably, I don't know, about twice a week. I think yeah, uh, I'd yeah, love I'm it. A big bit. music fan, and I've not heard of them before. Yeah, so and to get a, to be able to use that quote with them to go through um, lawyers was brilliant. Brilliant, yeah, and well worth uh, well worth asking. So yeah, we'll check them out. And um, now you're also allowed to take a DVD. Now a DVD can be a film or a <laughs> Got your finger again there, haven't I? I've got, um, you're like tapping into my, I've got, I, if we were downstairs, I would show you the shelves of DVDs I have down there. But you can only take one uh, and it can be a film or it can be a TV series. Oh, it's going to be concert, a film. So... <laughs> God, just one. <laughs> I'm gonna go. Now, I, I have interesting conversations about this because I one of the one of the writers on my MA, Mill Nygate, is a bit of a um, you know, she's a script doctor, film script doctor for a living. 
and she has very strong views about films and she thinks my favorite film is a pile of cack um uh but you know just to torment her even further i'm going to take um field of dreams the kevin costner yeah, movie brilliant film. Um, which i've always loved and I, I watch regularly um i think it's just a wonderful film i think yeah. it's a throwback to the kind of films of the 1950s a slight fantasy yeah element to it but basically about a man's relationship with his father yeah uh, and i i can't get enough of that it's a great yeah. movie and burt lancaster's in it for god's sake how That's can it be about a movie? <laughs> great film great choice and uh, i'm sure that'll get watched many times while you're on the island so <laughs> this one's gonna be right up your street this is your favorite food now because obviously we're on like a fantasy island it can be something that <coughs> can be your favorite meal that keeps reappearing or or whatever so is there a particular food ingredient or a particular dish but if there was just one that you could take which you would you, you know that would like either remind you of your childhood or a favorite restaurant or i mean this whole show is just made for me isn't it i've got a dvd <laughs> collection i've got music coming out of my ears yeah. I, I do all the cooking at home and in the people's kitchen um but i've just got too much choice i could do 20 editions and choose 20 different things um there's a Nigel Slater dish that I don't make very often. Um, my daughter used to love it, but she's now in Canada and my wife doesn't like gnocchi and it's a gnocchi uh, dish. Um, so I don't really make it anymore. But I love Nigel Slater's cooking. It's very rustic and kind of simple, but incredibly flavoursome. So there's a really simple gnocchi dish he does, which you'll find online. It's definitely... I. It, uh, it's it's like gnocchi and spinach and dolce lata or any blue cheese really and you literally just get some fresh gnocchi um, cook it in like five minutes put it in a dish you pour in some cream uh, dot loads of blue cheese around and then um, just uh, wilt some spinach and put that in and then put it in the oven for about half an hour Wow! Um, and it's <laughs> so moorish I mean you could eat it with a spoon quite happily yeah. um, uh, so for flavour and simplicity I I'd recommend that Brilliant. Big, chunk of, a... big chunk of bread as well to yeah. dip in yeah, that's a, a great, great meal. And um, as I say, one that um, you, you would definitely enjoy on the island. Now, and it's definitely I, online, Joe. That recipe, I've looked it, it up online. So Nigel Slater, blue cheese gnocchi, you'll, blue you'll cheese find gnocchi. it. Yeah, super. Now, here's a, here's going, this is going to be an interesting one. So the final thing to, to take to the island with you, and this really can be literally anything, and we've had some weird and wonderful answers, but it's your luxury item. <laughs> I did a quite I remember actually about a year ago I did a questionnaire that was quite similar to this and I know what I took then and I think I may as well stick I may as well be consistent um I took a shaving kit right. uh I don't you know I don't I don't mind not shaving you know when you work from home you, you tend not to shave every single day but I don't tend to go more than a couple of days um and I think I'd probably, it would be quite nice. It's quite a it's nice feeling. Like as well. a, wet, a wet shave? Yeah, yeah, a wet shaving yeah. kit with the brush and the foam. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of water there I can use. So yeah, that's all right. <laughs> and then, you know, I can, you know, for when, for when that, um, you know, attractive woman falls off a boat and swims <laughs> up to the island, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking my best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you get your own mermaid. <laughs> Well, that's great. So a shaving kit. Now that is a little bit, uh, a little bit different, but uh, a good choice. And I can see where where you're coming from with that. So that's you're all packed now. You're ready to go off to the island so you can enjoy your knocky and your field of dreams <laughs> and all your clockwork orange books and all that. And uh, until you get rescued. <laughs> so before we go. Perhaps you can just tell everyone because we actually I actually missed this out at the end, but perhaps you can at the beginning. Sorry, perhaps you can tell everybody where they can get your books um, and where you are on social media, website, things like that. Okay. Um, uh, well, the books are available from pretty much everywhere. The Man on the Street is out in all formats, um, so it's pretty easy to get a hold of wherever. Uh, One Way Street, the sequel. Uh, is out in paperback next month, November the 11th. Um, so all the other formats are out there uh, in the usual places, but the paperback will be out on November the 11th, I think it is. 
uh, and the third book in the trilogy, the third and final book of the trilogy, Dead End Street, uh, is out in January next year. In, in, they're doing it slightly differently for the third ones. The first two were released early in ebook and audio and then the other formats. Um, Dead End Street is hardback, ebook and audio book all on the same day in January uh, and then the paperback later in the year. Uh, I'm quite uh, often on Twitter. I think it's fair to say it's uh, at Trevor Wood Wright, which is W-R-I-T-E. Uh, and I do have a website uh, and I think it's called trevorwoodauthor.co.uk. You think? You think? <laughs> I try. I, you know, by all means, have a look at it. But I, I, it's, it's a token website. You know, they always tell you, you've got to have a website. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a website. And a friend of mine did it and it looks, you know, and I'm really happy with it. Um, but I don't use it that much. I don't, um, I don't blog it. or anything like that. Yeah. But I am on Twitter a lot. And I do have a Facebook author page, Trevor Wood Author. Um, but to be frank, uh, you can barely differentiate it from my own page, and I pretty much befriend anybody who asks me. So um, you're probably better off just going to my Facebook page and sending me a friend request. Uh, but you will get to see a lot of pictures of me in pubs if you do that. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like the foot. How many were you on now? A thousand, <laughs> a thousand and nine, is it? Something? Oh, it's a bit more than that, John. I do a Bars of the World series because, well, before lockdown, I used to travel a lot, and hopefully, I'll get back into that. But so I've got, uh, I think I'm up to about 1,027 or something. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Love it. And just out of interest as well, a little bit uh, about your audio book, because uh, I know we have a lot of sort of people that watch this yeah. and like doing audio books. So how, how did sort of that come about? Did you have any inputs towards who sort of read it or? Very bizarrely. Um, <clears throat> I mean, like I said, I, I've written about, co-written about 12 plays, um, one of which was a play called Alf Ramsey Knew My Grandfather, which, which yeah, I mean, being kind of north, north base, you might have heard the story. There's a football team, West Auckland football team, um, like 100 years ago, uh, who won what they try and call the first World Cup, but it was really the first international football tournament. Um, and there's been, there was a TV film made about it years and years ago with um, Dennis Waterman and Tim Healy were in it. Uh, and and um, when the 100th anniversary of that came around, which must have been 2010 around then, I think, uh, Ed and I were asked by the Durham Gala to write a play about it. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a play. We were like football play on stage. That's not going to be easy. But, but yeah. you know, manfully accepted the commission. Um, and wrote what is one of my favourite of our plays, actually. Alf Ramsey knew my grandfather. It's a huge amount of fun. Basically about six minors who get dragged out of nowhere to go and play football. We, we couldn't afford 11 actors, so <laughs> we had to you know, play around with it a bit. But there's all kinds of lovely stories about it. that they Nobody could understand why West Auckland football team were playing that. Like Juventus were playing in this tournament. Um, and there's a, there's a myth, myth story which we stuck to, is that they meant to invite Woolwich Arsenal who were the best team in England at the time. West Auckland were like in a non-league, you know, they, they were bottom of the non-league. Um, so we think they addressed a letter to WAFC yeah, and it ended up at West Auckland. Um, and, you know, they'd not even been out of the northeast, let alone the country. It was, it's a great story. But anyway, the main actor in that uh, play was a guy called Dave Nellist, who, who obviously, because we're there all the time in rehearsals and he's from the northeast, uh, became a, a great friend. Um, and then several years later, uh, when my publishers were looking for somebody to narrate the audiobook, I wasn't involved at all, not, not in any way, until they sent me a link and said, look, we think we found the perfect guy to narrate your book. Um, and I didn't even click on it because I saw who it was. And I just said, yeah, absolutely. Let's get Dave on. So he's from Wall's End in Newcastle. He's got a, 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 and it's joyous for me because obviously I'm not originally from Newcastle. And I do try and write. Um, in a not entirely in a Geordie dialect, but there is a lot of Geordie dialect in the book. So when I do public readings, I have to apologise right at the start and say, "Sorry, I'm I'm literally banned from doing a Geordie accent by my family." Um, so to have the the audio book narrated by a real Geordie is a real pleasure for me, and and it's it's lovely for writers to actually know the guy who does it because when he's recording, he actually will be texting me and saying, "This thing on page forty, you know." Is this what's happening really? And, and how do I pronounce this and stuff like that? So 
it, it's it, I've got a bit more input than I would normally have, which is great. And he does an, an amazing job, an absolutely brilliant job. Yeah, and it's brilliant the relationship you have with him as well. So that's, uh, that's yeah, it's it's well. it's great. Uh, and I've been to see him. He's been he's he's quite a, a a popular actor in the West End. So he's been in Billy Elliot many times. He played the boxing coach in Billy Elliot. He's been in War Horse, uh, Curious Incident. Does a lot of West End work. Um, so I've seen him on stage quite a few times as well. So, uh, yeah, it's great to have him on board. Brilliant. So any of our audiobook fans, uh, definitely uh, go and you've got the back, bit of a background story. Oh, the other thing I should say, Joe, about Dave, just to bring it back, the full circle to crime. Go on. Uh, for, those who, for those who like the um, Benedict Cumberbatch, Martin Freeman, Sherlock Holmes TV version, uh, in the very first episode... Uh, People will might remember that Martin Freeman is John Watson is wandering through the park uh, and somebody stops him and finds out that he's a, a loose end and says, I'll introduce you to my friend Sherlock Holmes. Uh, that's Dave Nellis, my wow. actor friend, plays. Um, I can't remember the character's name. It's Mike something. But he's the character who introduces Martin Freeman to Benedict Cumberbatch in um, Sherlock Holmes and actually dines out on that now because he gets invited to... Uh, Sherlock Holmes conventions yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. So he has a huge amount of fun from that that small and role. Does. Yeah, and it's a great link back into the crime. Exactly. Because, yeah, you know, perfect. He's acting it, and now he's, you know, he's making audio books on it. So that's brilliant. Anyway, Trevor, many thanks for coming along, and hope you have a Pleasure. great time on the island. It's been great to chat to you. With you. And so we've been planning this for a while on and off, but we managed to finally get there. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure, Jeff. I great will be fun. cutting you off straight away because my computer plays up a bit. So just so <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I want to make sure we get the recording. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Lovely Thank to you. chat. See Bye -bye. you again. Bye bye.